I'm here today with Mr. Greg Ellis, a best-selling author, TV director, Annie Award-nominated voice artist, and Emmy Award-nominated actor. He's appeared in Oscar-winning movies, directed Hollywood superstars, produced and written television shows, starred in Broadway musicals, and voiced animated characters for movies, television series, cartoons, and more than 120 video games. His major motion picture film credits include the Pirates of the Caribbean series Titanic, Star Trek, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and Beowulf. His television credits include 24, X-Files, CSI, Dexter, NCIS, and Hawaii Five-0. With his production company, Monkey Toes, Mr. Ellis has written and directed projects for Kiefer Sutherland and Stephen Fry, who's been on this podcast. He's also the host of several popular video podcasts, and he additionally founded the child advocacy program, The Respondent, which inspires family champions through his non-profit CPU, Children and Parents United. His book, which we're going to concentrate on today, at least to some degree, is The Respondent, exposing the cartel of family law. It's a call to action and a necessary one to reform the one branch of our legal system that does not provide the presumption of innocence, family law. Yeah, well, that's quite a claim that that branch of family law, that branch of law does not provide the presumption of innocence. So maybe we could start by exactly what you mean by that and why you would make that claim. Well, uh, yeah, through personal experience. First of all, thank you for having me on, Jordan. It's great to be on your show. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, yeah, family law, the, uh, the only branch of our legal system where there's no presumption of innocence. Uh, murderers, rapists, terrorists, pedophiles all get more legal rights than law-abiding citizens. And this, uh, the silver bullet, as I call it, the silver bullet playbook or paradigm of high-conflict divorce, the smoking gun of this corrupt legal system, um, that's become the go-to strategy for divorce lawyers uh, that guarantees victory and they encourage the, the petitioners and the respondents to use, usually petitioners, to utilize this strategy, usually the false allegation of domestic violence, um, to win in court, court to get the, uh, the cash and prizes, for want of a better phrase. Um, and... You know, when I when I I had no idea of the words family law before uh, what happened to me happened to me in 2015, um, and once I started investigating through experience and through talking with other experts uh, in the system outside the system, uh, it became clear to me that the, we we have a real issue here, and if we can improve or reform the family court or the family law system, expose the cartel of family law as I call it, because it is like a crime syndicate. These quasi kangaroo courts that they have. Um, you don't get the presumption of innocence. You don't get your rights read to you. Uh, I've spoken with fathers in particular who've been in, who've been ended up in court, uh, with false allegations of domestic violence. One, one told me a story about he put his wrists up and said, Your Honor, arrest me. Have the bailiff arrest me. And the judge said, Are you crazy? Uh, and, and the gentleman said, No, if I'm arrested, I'll get the rights that a criminal has, Miranda rights, access to an attorney, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, those who are suffering the most are the people who don't have the wherewithal or the financial resources to be able to have representation. And even those who do, if you are the respondent, you are behind the curve. It is uh, the, the, pres the, the, the presumption is that you as the accused have to prove your innocence rather than the accused, which is Western jurisprudence, has to prove their case. Um, and yeah, so well, I it think it's like it in, in our society, in a lot of strange ways, the accuser now seems to have almost an untrammeled right to be believed. And there's an increasing insistence on that in our culture as well, which is, for example, there was a, this is a bit far afield, but German chemistry journal the other day, scientific journal, published their new guidelines for authors in the aftermath of a scandalous chemistry paper they published, which hypothetically offended some people, that now authors have to be what would you say? Governed by the realization that their words will be interpreted by those who read them and that they have the final say, those who read them. Mm. And so and online, too, you can be accused of virtually anything and then mobbed for view virtually anything. And it's virtually impossible to defend yourself. And this notion that 
merely because someone says they've been offended, let's say, in the mildest of cases, that that means you have definitively done something wrong is, well, there's a pervasive and broad scale move in that direction in our culture. So what happened in your case? You were the respondent in a divorce case, which you didn't see coming. Is that is that, that's correct? I read your book. It was a while back. So I'm pulling all the bits of it back into my memory. But let's go through the story exactly. And Sure. And just, just very briefly to that point, yes, victimhood has become the new social currency. Its economy is booming. And where victimhood is rewarded, responsibility never follows. So it's part of the reason I call the book The Respondent. It's the defendant in a family law case. And the, um, the petitioner is that person who actually instigates the proceedings. So um, you know, uh, what happened to me in the span of, I'd say, around eight hours, uh, I'd been married for 20 years, two children, two boys, the, the meaning of my life. Uh, we did everything together. I was that engaged, loving, present father. Family was my everything. And, How old um, were your boys at that point? 10 years old and eight years old at the time. Okay. And you said you've had quite a stellar career and and obviously, we're very busy doing that. So in what sense was your family at the center of your life? That's a great question. Yeah, I think my my now ex-wife and I, were, we, we drifted somewhat to become a well-oiled marriage machine. Um, the avoidant in her and the anxious in me couldn't quite get close enough. I think uh, Pia Melody calls it the uh, co-addicted love tango, uh, where we, we were kind of swaying back and forth, trying to get closer, but drifting apart. I would be out of town filming a movie and return and she go out of town because she wanted to work and I supported that. I would have preferred she stayed home, but she wanted to work. So I was like, great. So we worked our schedules out that, that we could be present. And much of my work was, was in town in Hollywood um, at, at one of the studios. So, uh, you know, I, mean, my, I, had a, I had a busy career and but my I would still say, as you did, that my family was the center of my life. If I had to choose existentially between my family life and my career, I would have chosen my family life. And but I was busy and working. And while well, you have to be busy and working to actually support a family. So but it's it's a it's a strange claim in some sense. Right. If you have a career that's really moving forward at a rapid rate, how you can claim simultaneously that your family is still the most important thing to you. It means partly because part of the reason you have a career, if you have any sense, is so that you can bring stability and opportunity to your family. And that means, in some sense, you can't be with them all the time. But they don't need that anyways, because they should have some autonomy. So, okay, so, but now you said, too, your marriage, you said you drifted apart a bit with your wife. And yeah. so when this happened, this eight-hour period that you're describing, did you think afterwards, oh my God, I should have seen this coming, or I did see this coming, or has it remained a has it remained a a shock to you? And then what do you think about the fact that it was a shock? I mean, because obviously the thing to wonder is, well, were were you willfully blind and should have you seen this coming? And mm. I'm not claiming that you were. I'm these are, you know, they're genuine questions. But people are gonna wonder, obviously. Yeah, well, well, look, in, in the in the span of eight hours, I was ushered from my home in handcuffs at the behest I later discovered of my ex-wife. Um, I was committed to a mental institution against my will, the first of five incarcerations. Uh, there was also an incarceration in, in, I called it solitary confinement, but it was a singular jail cell. Uh, subjected to a temporary restraining order in divorce court on the basis of a false allegation that eventually was disproven some six months later. But by then, of course, the reputation savaging had been done and um, it was all over by the shouting. I became homeless and almost destitute overnight uh, and and lost uh, my, you know, my, my professional re reputation. I wouldn't say it was irretrievably destroyed, but you know, in the small, close-knit community that I lived in, in Hollywood, close to uh, close to the studios, um, it certainly took a big dent. And uh, the everybody lives in a small, close-knit community like that mm. if they're working. I mean, the immediate people that you are in contact with and working with intensely tends to be a quite a small number. And it's quite interesting when you get tarred and feathered. The the people around you get afraid of the contamination real, real quickly. And that's partly because they look at what happened to you. And then they also think, well, you know, 
we don't really know what went on in the marriage and people are capable of terrible things and maybe there were things that yeah. we don't know about and then they're split because they knew you and your wife and and so it gets complicated instantly and then it's easier for people just not to have that much to do with you because they also have choices right because they know a reasonable number of people and it's then maybe you fall from number one or number two on their list of people to invite to like number 15 and they only ever invite the top 10. And so people don't even have to turn their backs on you that much in order for you to be, well, friendless. And so these, these, and the allegation, what exactly was the allegation? And why do you think that your wife felt compelled to, to make it? And how do you think she rationalized that to herself if it wasn't true? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, she had been diagnosed with panic disorder. She wasn't taking her medication. She was out of town. Um, and she had called the police on this particular day, March 5th, 2015. And she'd asked them to come to the house. I was, I'd actually taken the afternoon off. I was at home with my sons playing in the playroom with them. And she asked them to come to the house and said that I was confused. And the, the dispatch said, we can't go to the house if he's confused. She said, well, what do you need to hear? And they said, we need to hear he's a threat to himself or the children. And then allegedly sometime later, I think 45 seconds later, she, uh, she called them back and said, uh, she said, my husband's just told me, quote, I'm sick of this shit. I'm gonna harm the children, end quote. And those 10 words, that 10 word lie was, was the basis of law enforcement coming. First, it was two to my front door. Then it was three. Then it was five and a sergeant and the massing garrison, uh, the threshold of, of my home, um, without cause, uh, without a warrant. Um, my rights were trampled. Um, the police entered a smart team from the DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, came in. I was shackled in handcuffs with a bar uh, behind my behind my back in a quite affluent neighborhood uh, with the curtains wide open on a Thursday evening. Right. Well, that would be a little hard on your reputation, all right. <laughs> won't it? <laughs> yeah, I would I mean, say so. And, and you know, then of what course, are people you know, going to think? What are they going to think? Well, They're going to think the whole police system is corrupt and that this is all made out of nothing and he's actually innocent. It's like... It's pretty damn hard for people to jump to that conclusion uh, Correct. instantly. Yeah, that's and then, that's and then rough. of course, what 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 then what then happened was, you know, I was kind of bundled into the back of a uh, an unmarked police car and you know raced off into the middle. One of the, actually one of the most heartbreaking images I remember was looking up from the back of that police car um, and seeing my son, my eldest boy Charlie, God, at the window, alive. and ah. Uh, Jordan, yeah, that's it, rough, man. Um, seeing seeing my son, my son's childhood at ten was over. I knew what was coming: spousification, adultification, um, the the vilification and the erasure of me as a man, as a father, as a patriarch, as a provider. Um, and I was also heading into a terrifying unknown, a dystopian odyssey. It, 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 I, I talk about it as if it's some kind of Kafka trap, but it certainly was Kafka-esque. And then, of course, the, 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 the word on the street. I mean, some of the stories I later heard back were absolutely insane. I mean, he's armed. He's psychotic. He's the, I mean, she was telling everyone that I was psychotic and I was bipolar. All of these messages, messages came through that my children as well when I eventually got to see them. And there was no end in sight. It was just down the rabbit hole we go. And of course, I thought I would get justice. Uh, oh, naively. Yeah. Don't I, be I, thinking I was the just <laughs> no, no. The justice system is mostly there to stop people who can't reconcile their differences from wreaking social havoc. That's basically what it's there for. To think if you do you think you're going to go to the justice system and get justice? It's like you'll be lucky if it doesn't destroy you once you're tangled up in it. So it, ne it nearly did. It nearly destroyed yeah, well, I'm me. Amazed I mean, it, it didn't. It's, it's amazing that it didn't and that you managed to to get through this. And so, okay, so this happened and then you're off to the police station. And the thing is, the police are going to view themselves in a situation like that as white knights, right? Because they've come in and you can That's understand right. that they've come in at the behest of a woman and the God only knows how abused she's been because women do get abused and that's for sure. And so, and of course, the guilty act innocent, just like the innocent act innocent, probably the guilty are even better at it. And so, 
And then you're going to be viewed with suspicion because men are going to be viewed with suspicion in a situation like this, for sure, where there's allegations of abuse. And that's because there are a handful of bad men and then bad impulses in all of us that, you know, that can be dragged out one way or another. And so, okay, so why did your wife double down on it, do you think? I think there's a, I think there are probably a few possible reasons. One, I think, is shame. Uh, sh the, the emotion or, you know, we talk psychology is an extremely powerful emotion. And I think once she'd let Pandora out of the box, if you will, I think the only thing left was hope. Um, and it was hope for her existence. I think there was fear and panic that instilled in herself about that suddenly after 20 years of living a great life together and building a great life and a great home and a great family, which is, you know, is so important. It's my primary reason for being um, uh, that she perhaps was unaware somewhat of the system and how the system comes in and forces, I mean, you know, when I found out that the, the states get reimbursed $6,000 for every child um, that they place into foster care and 4,000 children a day lose a parent in family law, um, there are financial incentives in place. Um, and the Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1974 offers financial incentives to the states that increase these foster or adoption numbers. And to receive these incentives and bonuses, local uh, child protection services must have more children. They must have more, quote, merchandise to sell. Uh, funding is available when a child is placed in a foster home with strangers or placed in a mental health facility or medicated, as it's called, usually against the parents' wishes. So... Um, I think she was also her family system system of origin, her mother, uh, Appalachian woman, um, a very proud woman, twice married, twice divorced. She, she came in strong, moved into the family home straight away the same night. She actually got back. She got to the family home before my ex-wife returned when I was incarcerated. And it was that um, psychological uh, kind of hammering home that you need to do this, you need to do that. And when the CPS came in and said, you know, you need to, uh, uh, you need to start divorce proceedings, uh, you need to uh, file for divorce, you need to file for a restraining order, otherwise your children will go into foster care. Um, that threat, I'm sure, must have been terrifying for her as well. So having opened and the Why did they box, threaten her specifically? That was the Child Protection Services. Why did they threaten her with having the children go into foster care? Was it because well, she was hypothetically unable to protect them from you if she didn't take certain actions? What, what was the reason? It's my understanding that this is what they do. This is the modus operandi of the CPS because they need to, yeah. like traffic wardens, need to have enough tickets. The CPS yeah, well, God need help to make you if me you ever get contact. God help you if you ever got get tangled up with child protective services. Oof. That's that's I do and, and I got I got a few months later I managed to get the report that the CPS this woman ugh this this social worker mm -hmm. for the CPS who came in and ruined you know played a large part in ruining my family with the system and removing yeah, my well, son from having a father. Yeah, well social worker training is corrupt beyond belief too. Ugh. It's politically correct right to the bloody roots and and uh, so yeah. the you know the, the the many social workers will come into a situation with that like that, armed to the teeth with the presumption that the whole system is a patriarchal oppressive system. It's based on the exploitation of women and children, and they just need the tiniest bit of evidence to make sure that you're one of those patriarchal oppressors who they're going to take care that's of. Right. And so that's drummed yeah. into them like mad right from day one in social work training. And and increasingly, social work as a profession is completely permeated by ideologues of exactly that type. It's God help you if you fall into their hands. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I've learned this through my experience. And look, my, my sons were, they led a, a privileged life. It was an earned privileged life. You know, I had to work hard to get out of my small little town in England and, you know, go to London. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into the whole earned and unearned privilege, but that's why I'm a believer in just the same as offense isn't given. It's only taken. If you choose to take it, go ahead. Um, look, we all have our privileges and our disadvantages. And, you know, and some of them are earned and some of them aren't earned. And 
hopefully we pay for the ones that aren't earned by trying to be good people and by taking mm. the responsibility of that unearned privilege forward. But it's only a fool and an ideologue who goes after someone for their unearned privilege, because the same question can be asked very quickly and very effectively precisely of them. You know, I went to this Hollywood, I don't know what to call it, meeting on <laughs> someone's lawn once where everyone there was talking about the 1%. And this was in like Beverly Hills. And it was in the, it was on the lawn in a mansion. And I thought, well, I got up and said, you people might not be in the 1% by North American standards because you're not, you don't have a hundred million dollars, but you're in the 1% by global and historical standards. It's like, so who the hell exactly are we talking about here with this unearned privilege nonsense? So a little of that goes a long ways too. You know, I mean. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Count, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was, I was going to quickly say, you know, my sons, uh, you know, they 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 led a a, a privileged existence, um, but they were connected to their mother and their father, their biological mother and biological father. We had a family unit, um, and to to see, I mean, you know, a member of the country club, and I would take them golfing every Sunday and. Family, at least family dinner, because we were both out working, but we would all, that was my thing. We, we come together as a family, um, if we can every day and definitely on Sunday for the traditional roast dinner that we do in England. And then to read that report, Jordan, four months later, after I'd been in the fire, a 53 page, page report from the, from the DCFS and the social worker, I wept. I wept as I read, you know, the questions asked to my sons. Has daddy ever touched your penis? Has he ever put a needle in your arm? I mean, the, the questions Jesus that my Christ. sons were just, and I was still Well, you, you think about what questions like that do to kids. It's like, That's okay, it. first of all, you're telling the kids that there are adults that do this to children. So that's the first thing you're doing with the questions. And that's a bit of a revelation to the average child who's, say, eight or ten, who's really not being privy to such treatment. So you're confronting them with the idea of malevolence itself. Correct. And you're a stranger and you're asking them these weird questions that about like deep malevolence. And so what's up with the institutions, you might say. And then you're implying that their father did this. And if you're the typical, too typical social worker trained in this sort of nonsense, there's the kind of insinuation that goes along with that that's likely to produce nightmares in the children and phobia. Yes. And there's a big documented literature on that. It's like the, it, what do they call that? It's the false memory syndrome, essentially. That's like right. if you get into the hands of a bad therapist and they start poking around in your memory structure or, <sighs> or they can elicit stories from children, there's great documentation of all the daycare. Remember the satanic abuse scandals in the oh, 1980s? Yes. My God, yep. you read about what the, the social worker types and police too, what they did to children by asking them these leading questions. Leading it's questions. just absolutely pathological. And then you'd get kids coming up with these fantasies about what happened that were just, well, and then egged on by the police and the social workers until there was a satanic nightmare at the bottom of it and none of it ever happened. It's One of the proudest moments I have uh, uh, have of my sons at eight and ten, getting to page fifty one or fifty two in that report, and they were asked about um, me as a father and how they rated me, having rated their mother, and it was a plus plus plus. They they could so easily, to your point, have been led down the psychological garden path uh, to arrive at answers that were just fantasies and not real. Um, but um, that lasting impression that was left on them, one of the, one of the saddest, I, I, my, I, I, was, I was forced to visit with my sons, um, which the very notion of, I remember one father in family court who was told by a judge, you know, visitation, and he said, I will never visit my children. They are my right. children. And he turned and walked out. And I'll never forget that. I remember looking back years down the line of visitation, where that led. Um, because the visitation monitor happened to be, he had seven AKAs, used to be a woman, had a criminal record, um, and he drove around in, you know, a car with, with, you know, stickers of guns and NRA. And not that that's an issue, but just it all added up and there was nothing I could do. And I was getting blackmailed and there was no one I could go to. He was the only conduit. And then I found out that and he, he was there to supervise your visits. 
the right to basically let you know by by presence let my sons know that i was dangerous to be around or to be feared which i never had been and every piece of documentation in the visitation reports at least for the first 18 months um was we love you dad we want to live with you dad can't we see you and mom why can't why is mom doing this uh the first visit was uh dad mom says to not get in the car with you because you're going to kidnap us and you have biopolar i mean these these kinds of things were just harrowing to me to hear but there wasn't there wasn't ah, really any there's no man. there's nowhere to go there's nothing yeah. to there's no one to speak to but my eight-year-old i remember one visit I think it was maybe my second visit. My eight-year-old not only had suicidal ideations, at eight years old, my beautiful, innocent, playful lad, and he talked out loud about how he was going to kill himself. And I had to listen to that as this monitor listened to it and didn't even consider it a critical incident to report it. And anyway, who's he going to report it to and what are they going to do? They'd have That's probably right. said, That's just more he's had that your guilt. There you go. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. So this is this is why, Jordan, you know, I, I came back like a phoenix from the flames. I was dead and buried. I mean, I literally got to that edge of existential terror. And yeah, that's a long decided, way out there, that edge. Whoa. Have you visited? Uh, yeah, I've been there for quite a while. Yeah. Oh, like man. For about two years. So. Mm. Mm. I feel mm -hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I'm interested, you know, we could talk more about my story, but I'm interested on how we teeter on that long edge, how we well, I was fortunate ride the I, waves. I, you know, I was fortunate, maybe in contrast to your situation, because what happened to me didn't happen in a manner that severed my closest intimate relationships. They were still yeah. intact. And so when I got very ill and was also being attacked constantly, my friends and my family were like rocks. And so thank God mm. for that. But so I didn't lose that. And, you know, I, I don't think I would have lived if I would have lost that too. And so. Yeah. I know. remember talking when Kayla came on my show, the respondent, and we talked about, you know, that whole situation. I, again, I was moved to tears. The podcast you did with her when you came back and just your struggle and, and what you'd given to society and humanity and the uh, outrageous attacks um, from cowards um, who, who are, you know, the cowards think they have courage and they're, they're, they're placed on the pedestals of, of social media and, uh, and um, they're, they're not. Um, and and, and with, with, with what happened to me and my boys, that led me on a journey. I, 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 I guess the the big pinnacle moment for me, and I didn't read that much at school. I only read scripts as I went through my career, you know, whether it be screenplays or doing voiceovers. It was, it was 2016. Um, I went right to the edge and I, and I, and I came back from the edge and I don't know where this came from, but I asked myself the meaningful question, who am I? And I opened up my iPhone and I did a deep dive dialectical of meaningful question and meaningful answer of the thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And um, I got over 1,000 uh, answers and questions. I still have them. And, um, and that led me through to learn a little about uh, philosophy, phenomenology, affect theory, um, and uh, just epistemology in general. And how I could ritualize my way back to back to be on my feet again because I was fetal. Um, my, I think my parasympathetic nervous system was just shaking, and I was and I, I the blinds were closed. I couldn't see or hear another human being because there was probably going to be a child laughing, which would remind me of the devastation of losing my sons, the meaning of my life. And so I had to I had to really get in that, that deep conversation with self. Um, me, self, and the third eye of per perception, and and really get the walking going again, and and the talking going again, and trying to get more precise with the words I was thinking and expressing, and rebuild and reform and restore, um, not a, the same life. You know, I say we have two lives, and the second life begins the moment we realize we have only one. 
uh, but that new chapter, that new episode, and how to self-author, if you will, um, you know, life is remembered backwards and lived forwards. Well, how can I redraft that floppy disk in my mind, if you will, or outside? Why did you decide to bother? This episode is sponsored by Theragun. Theragun is an awesome product. They're handheld percussive therapy devices for your muscles. Dad uses these, mom uses these. I used to use them for stomach massages for anxiety. They're super effective and actually kind of fun. Whether you're athletic or lean over a computer all day or just trying to make it through the day, tension-free Theragun can help. The Gen 4 Theragun learns from your behavior, gets to the source of the pain and releases tension. Elite athletes and teams like Real Madrid use the Theragun all the time. It can improve muscle recovery, decrease anxiety, or just give you a massage. And they have an exclusive offer for JBP listeners. Try Theragun for 33 days, starting at only $199. Go to therabody.com slash JBP right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's therabody.com slash JBP therabody.com slash jbp this episode is brought to you by manscaped men listen up the lawnmower 4.0 features skin safe technology to reduce the risks of nicks and cuts when you're trimming it's waterproof it has a powerful motor a 4000k led spotlight and even a travel lock manscaped recently launched the ultimate hygiene bundle for you or the man in your life the performance package 4.0 It includes the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Trimmer, a deodorant, toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code PETERSON20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com if you use the code PETERSON20. Unlock his confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Do you think, I mean, was... You know, because I look, you you, t- you tell a story in the respondent of, well, it's not just an encounter. What would I say? It's an encounter with arbitrary, with the arbitrariest form of authority. And and then that reputation savaging. You're accused of doing something terrible. It's so terrible that it's very difficult for people not to view you with tremendous suspicion as soon as you're accused of that. And so then everything you have is stripped away from you. Well, not everything. That's the issue. It's like, what isn't stripped away from you? And why did you decide to continue? I mean, you you lost your career, you lost your reputation, you lost your family, and then you're being pilloried constantly. And that's also really hard psychologically, because there must have been part of you during all this that was thinking, well, I must have done something wrong. I mean, how can this, like, what did I do wrong so that this occurred? You know, all these people are after me and they're making these accusations of malevolence. And, you know, am I, who's the crazy person here exactly? Is it this weird situation where it's everyone but not me? It's like, that sounds crazy. So how do you withstand that? And, and I mean, it must partly, I guess, the positive responses of your sons must have been heartening under those conditions. The fact that when you did see them, you could still see that they loved you and that that bond was still there. And so that's definitely a touchstone. It was for a while, for a long while, but under the unrelenting inescapability of the trauma, you know, trauma resides in the body and the body keeps the score. And going through this, I could see the trauma that was being enacted on them, their loss, their grief, their living grief. I talk about suicide by living grief. I, I, you know, some of the fathers, many fathers, some mothers too, who are, who are no longer with us because of that suicide by living grief, the, the inescapability that there isn't a finality to the grief. There isn't a yeah. finality to the mourning process to be able to, memorialize and lay to rest that last chapter of my book i think it's chapter 17 a funeral for my sons was i had to find some way to make meaning in that moment uh to to lay to rest the childhoods that had been stolen from them and that sense of fatherhood and being that uh father to them um so that that was and then of course i had to find a way to make to sense make through this and 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 find a way to help and give back. I think you know the there was part of me that uh, 
throughout my career had always been, what can I get? What role can I get? And we're always living to the next, to the next projected moment of, you know, if, if you're on tour, I'm playing this venue. Can I get to a bigger venue next year? Can I play to more people, make more money? And that's the continuing cycle of projecting into the next moment, not living in the now moment. And that's what can I get? And where I moved to was what can I give? How can I give? You know, he who has a why can bear any how. Well, I got to the how. And, and, and for me, it was working through uh, some kind of story within my own story, which made it more, more traumatic because even writing the book, I hadn't really authored a book before. So I was having to revisit the trauma of the experience and then read the audio book and talk about it. So it's this perpetual cycle, but fueling being able to help people. Being able to at least when, when it happened to me, Jordan, I looked, I looked online, um, you know, for, I was the black sheep looking online for some kind of help and hope. And the only thing available were, um, 1-800 numbers for attorneys and law firms in family law to make money and books written by women for women on how to ruin your husband and get the cash and prizes, the silver bullets. Um, the only book I found was Alec Baldwin's book, A Promise to Ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I could only get 15 pages into that because they, and he emailed me and said, this is the best I can offer right now. Read my book. His is literally, it starts in the star chamber of family law. Whereas my story, as you know, it, it kind of, that's the second. It's in three parts. Part one is fear. Part two is loathing. Part three is redemption. And it moves into the second part, into the system and the systematic uh, institutionalized um, uh, bias of, of how courts perceive, how individuals within the court system, judges, child psychologists perceive men and fathers um, and the family unit um, and this, you know, the neo-feminist kind of radical fourth way of feminism that does the devalues the patriarchy. I don't want to go, go too down that, um, um, discussion. Yeah, but that well, it's worth, it's, lot, it's but, worth, well, you know, if, if the idea that marriage itself is a patriarchal and oppressive institution, isn't far removed from the idea that the nuclear family, especially a two parent nuclear family is not to be preferred, say, over a one-parent nuclear family. So what the hell difference does it make if you break one up? And how do you know the father isn't just an oppressive, what would you say, exploiter? Because that goes along with the entire rest of your philosophy. And then you might say, well, that's just philosophy. Who cares? It's like, yeah, you wait till it gets a hold of your leg. You'll find out who cares real soon because it's going to yes. be you. And you think that's not philosophy. It's like, hmm, you're going to find out real different real soon. And you're not going to like a bit of it. Yeah, too true. And when, and when I, you know, when I, huh, when I looked into the stats, when I looked, when I found out that the world leader in children growing up in single parent households was America, when I found out that 43% of American children live without their father, 63% of youth suicides are from dad deprived homes. I know you've had uh, Dr. Warren Farrell on your show talking about yeah, this the noted dad right, deprivation. The noted men's right fascist. You know, oh, him, yes. He's, the guy he's, used to yeah, be on the National Organization <laughs> of Women. And yeah, right. he's a real fascist, old Warren Farrell. But it's so, like, where have all the mentors gone? Well, it's no surprise we don't we don't have many men or as many men stepping in. Well, we're we're okay sending them off to war, um, but you know, in terms of like stepping into the public conversation, uh, because you know, because patriarchy, because smash them, because believe all. Uh, we should listen, yes, but believe all women? No. Time's up, good riddance. Um, glad they're gone, done. Uh, we look at organizations like, you know, once great storied organizations like the ACLU. Yeah. Um, you know, gone, done, over. Um, can't be trusted. Um, then you know, there's the me, Southern Poverty Law Center. They're lots oh, of fun too. Yeah. Aren't they? They're just a oh, barrel yeah. of laughs. Yeah, um, they are. They're just a blast, those people. I mean, look, we, we, when we have an industry, going back to family law, when we have a nearly $60 billion a year American divorce machine, that's what the cartel makes, $60 billion. It's not incentivized to, um, to, to reform itself. Um, you know, yeah, well, the, two divorce, states. the whole divorce industry can feast on the accumulated wealth of a once stable family. And so that's right. obviously it's going to produce a tremendous amount of 
parasitic activity. Now, that leads us to a deeper question here, too, is, look, many of the people in my immediate family have been divorced. And so, you know, I don't ask such questions lightly, but we did have a notion in our society for a very, very long time that divorce was wrong. And, and as I said, many people in my mm -hmm. family have been divorced and they had difficulty in their marriages and sometimes they established much more satisfactory, let's say, second marriages. But it isn't obvious to me at all that liberalizing the divorce statutes, especially in relationship to no-fault divorce, which was supposed to be you know, an easy pathway forward has produced anything but an absolute, absolute carnage in its, in its wake. And so, I, obviously, having lived through these problems, you're very much inclined and motivated to find solutions. And, and what do you think of in relationship to solutions? I mean, I think, I didn't believe this when I was younger, but I think 50-50 custody should be the default in every divorce case and that both parties should have to argue against that rather than the presumption being that the children, especially when young, are better off with their mother. And I don't say that lightly because I know that particularly for children under nine months old, that maternal care is really primary. But the fact that the default position is custody with the mother get, puts men in an unbelievably bad situation. And so and the Absolutely, children yeah. as well. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on 50-50 default shared parenting. There have been two states who've passed it, Kentucky and Arkansas. Kentucky, interestingly enough, they passed 50-50 shared parenting in a large part because I believe it's illegal for um, for the legal industry to lobby politicians there. And that's the challenge, is that when you have a such, such a huge, very wealthy um, lobbying group, the state bar associations who write their own family law codes in the wild west of family law, they write the codes and they spend money at the last couple of weeks before, you know, a, a, a bill has dropped and they lie and they skew the statistics and people believe them and bills don't pass. But Kentucky did pass. Arkansas passed. I'm when was really that? excited to say. When was that? Um, that was a, I believe Kentucky was 2019. Oh. Arkansas was more recent, but just, I literally just heard a week ago, um, that, uh, Senator, uh, not Senator, Representative Rodney Creech in Ohio. Um, it, this is a bipartisan bill. Normally these bills, when they're put through, uh, they usually have about 10 to 15 co-sponsors. We now on that bill, I have, I think we have 68 co-sponsors for an equal shared parenting bill in Ohio. So this is fantastic news for Ohioans, for families, for parents and for children. I think if we can improve the system and at least through 50-50 shared parenting, we can ease the burden on the mental health system, the physical health system, incarceration rates, dropouts from school, drug rates, child porn addiction, child um, yeah, well, online of, porn addiction. One of the stunning issues of our time, I would say, is that the statistics that two-parent families are better for children are absolutely overwhelming. Yep. And so it's quite the mystery that it's ignored. And I, I think part of the reason that that fact is ignored is because of this pervasive anti-patriarchal philosophy, let's call it that, that because that particular fact sticks so badly in the craw of that philosophy that it has to be ignored. And so... Yes. But then you ask yourself, well, who are we for here? Are we for the kids or for the adults? Because if we were for the kids, we'd be pushing two-parent families. And then that's rough, too, because if you say two-parent families are optimal, let's say, you're, you're faced with the necessity in some sense of having to discriminate against one-parent families, because if two is better, then one is worse. And, you know, then you point to the single mother struggling valiantly against all odds to do a credible job with her kids and it's not like people like that don't exist and then you're such a son of a bitch for daring to compare her horrible struggle to what's optimal but well, well what's I think the alternative that, that, yeah no it's a really good point and i think you know given the way the the system of government is set up it's it's very challenging the system has got so big that we almost need to blow it up and start again I think um, you yeah, know, there's you, no you, shortage of people working on that at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much right. to start it again, but definitely yeah. to blow it all up. 
Yeah, so, but in terms of improvements for family law, I think, look, you know, I'd mentioned the presumption of innocence, jurisprudence. You know, I talked with uh, Professor um, Robbie McCormick on, on my show, and we talked about jurisprudence and family and family law and the burden of proof that must be on the accuser and not the accused. You know, we, we, we're in family law, we're in the Salem witch trials, we're in the Spanish Inquisition. 50-50 yeah. shared parenting, obviously, a divorce must start with the default presumption that what is in the best interests of the children is for both parents to equally share in the parenting. Uh, we saw with Brad Pitt's divorce from Angie Jolie and the silver bullet that was used against him. And then he worked tirelessly through the retired judge and he won a victory, quote unquote, of 50-50 shared parenting. That should have been the, the default starting position. I think False allegations of DV is something domestic so, so let violence. Me, okay, let me push yep. back on that a moment, okay? Because this is what stopped me for years in relationship to, I suppose it was some intrinsic sympathy for the mother-infant bond and some realization that the maternal role is particularly important in the earliest years of childhood development. So what do you do with infants exactly? Do you go... Do you go for 50-50 custody there as well and then hope that the men have enough sense to to what exactly? It's pretty hard to find a substitute for a breastfeeding mother, you know? I mean, now, lots of breastfeeding mothers go back to work, and so obviously that can be negotiated. And maybe the issue is that it should be 50-50 regardless of the age of the child. And but then, and how do men, what do men do then when they have, you know, custody of a nine of a six month old infant? That's a real tough question. Yeah, it's so, a that's a really good question. I hadn't actually thought about that. Uh, you know, Brad and Angie's situation, they didn't have infants, but obviously case by case. But but the point being that it starts from the 50-50 and then immediately there can be an order if there is an infant that mother has, you know, primary custody 99% of the time or whatever that so, might okay, be. So but, it's, but then you a think scale. it should be it should be negotiated away from the 50-50 baseline. Exactly. So there's that two things the you'd really like to see change. One is the notion of the presumption of in innocence has to be brought within the rubric of the family courts and, and in implemented stringently and and efficiently. And the second is we start from the default proposition that it's 50-50 split. What about what happened to your assets? Let's talk about that. So you had, you had, well, we know that your career was terribly disrupted, but you'd built up, I would presume, a reasonable degree of, of wealth by that point. And so what happened on that front? So initially what happened when I was removed from, a, from my home on March 5th and incarcerated, the first visit from my ex-wife and uh, her mother uh, they arrived with no compassion. They basically slapped pieces of paper down and pens and said, write down the usernames and passwords for all of the financial institutions and the bank accounts. And, um, and I trust this was you were in custody. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that must I have been a fun. Custody. So what in the world were you thinking when that was happening? I mean, so I, what, cause I, I could say. I, Go ahead. Yeah, I was incoherent. Uh, you right. know, I was, I was, I was, I was dealing with the terror of being incarcerated and law enforcement and something I wasn't used to. Um, and, and hoping that they were going to help and that they needed right. it to do things and pay bills and whatnot. And then I find out afterwards the accounts got siphoned. Checks were being, you know, corporate checks were being, my signature was being, uh, forged. And, um, but family law, not, all of this evidence didn't seem to matter. Uh, so basically my, you know, the, the acquired wealth, uh, from the bank accounts and the brokerage accounts was just disappearing, I find out later. And then the claim is made uh, that the house, the family, the family residence was not mine and was hers. And when we met, um, it's, I think it's fair to say that my career was, was in a better position and I brought more financially to the, to the place, uh, to the start of the marriage. But the notion that she nearly won on that as well uh, just would have been Devs, I don't know if I'd if I'd be here speaking with you if if I'd lost on that uh, on that point. But it, Why that one particularly? Because because the accumulated. Well, I've been buying and selling properties since I was seventeen and started out as an actor in London. So the wealth that I'd accumulated was in the house. Um, you mm. know, it's an expensive house, and so the sale of that house didn't really need. There wasn't very much. There was a tiny mortgage left on it. 
So that was really the, I put everything into that house because I'm, I'm see, old school. I, I believe, you know, you own, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to owe money to people in America. I did I, this whole credit system of, you know, you have to get credit. You have to get credit where I come from. It's like, no, you just, if you want something, you buy it and you own it. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what I, I wanted see. to so have you with the put house. your I see so you put all the eggs in that particular basket and so yeah. and that wasn't taken away from you completely not not Why completely not? top rated doctor today many are available within 24 hours that's z o c d o c dot com slash j b p this episode was sponsored by relief band nausea can happen at the worst possible times it's one of the unpleasant experiences that can completely incapacitate you wherever you are. Relief Band is the number one FDA-cleared anti-nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and prevent nausea and vomiting. They even have the Relief Band Sport for the more adventurous listeners, which is waterproof and compatible with Apple or Android watches. It's a band you wear rather than a pill you take, so there are zero side effects. Relief Band makes a great gift for any time of year. Right now, they've got an exclusive offer just for JBP listeners. Go to reliefband.com and use promo code JBP. You'll receive 20% off plus free shipping and a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. So head to R E L I E F B A N D.com and use our promo code JBP for 20% off plus free shipping. What's the I don't understand what'll happen if you win. I mean, because if you win, it means that we've been that. Why not? Uh, because, um, well, the title was the title to the house was in my name and her name. And as much as she presented in court that it was her house and I wasn't on title, that piece of evidence um, was pretty crystal clear. Um, she couldn't steal that. And was um, that was that part of the basis for your ability to rebuild your your security? Let's say. Yes. Yes. I mean, I was homeless for a while. I was homeless for a good few months, um, but yeah, so for the I'm kindness of a few friends who gave me sofas and floors to sleep on. And a why? Few why did they do that? Why did? Why do you think they trusted you, given everything that had collapsed around you and? all the calumny that had been heaped on your name. And why those particular people, do you think? Well, it's a, that's, a, that's an insightful question. That just makes me, I, I, I look to what are the commonalities between those individuals. They were all men. Uh, there was one woman, um, so not all men, most of them men. And they'd all been through divorces. I see. I see. So, okay. So, so, so they had. But they some knew the character. They, they, they knew. They knew. Like there was one, one gentleman. I mentioned him in the book, Adam Fogelson, who was the chairman of Universal Studios. He was. He was. He knew who I was. He. I. I. Uh, my. His young. His eldest daughter and my. My son were in pre kindergarten together. I taught his daughter how to sing and play piano and songwrite. And hmm. so he knew that. He knew that even though. I was public enemy number one on the streets and I was being vilified. He didn't believe it. He, his integrity was so strong that when the second time, when I, when I finally got released or discharged, he had actually employed a security team, um, top notch security team to tr track the police scanners because they knew I, he knew I was going to come up for air. And of course I did at the neighbor's house. And then the, that was when there was a team of, I think 10 police, this was the second time, five days later, where they you just banged on the door and I opened the door and they dragged me out and handcuffed me again. And I got dressed down by the sergeant and this, this gentleman just kind of stepped out from the shadows and had a word with the sergeant and, and kind of, I got, I got unhandcuffed and I walked into what I thought, Jordan, I thought it was homelessness. And and he said, come with me. Someone's been looking out for you. And he, he walked me to Adam Fogels, Adam and Hillary Fogelson's house. Uh -huh, and, uh -huh. um, and so they, you did and have they, some relationships there that withstood the test of time. You can imagine yeah. what would happen if you lost that too, man. So I had this yeah. client, his wife just, he was a good guy, hyper conscientious, professional. And uh, his wife just, she, she nailed him with accusations of abuse. And she was very attractive and charming and very manipulative and malevolent. And white knights were riding to her aid all the time. And he mm. wanted to uh, get 50-50 custody of his kids. And she 
she, first of all, with the allegations of abuse, destroyed his professional reputation. So that means he lost all his clients in his profession. And then she accused him of hiding the money because he was having a hard time making alimony payments because he did, couldn't make any money because his profession had been ruined. And so then he set himself up again, providing health care to basically indigenous people on social services. And then he made a go of that. And then she accused him again in court of having money that he was drawing on. So they froze his bank accounts and and uh, and, and garnished his wages. And so that made it very difficult for anybody mm. to hire him. And then they could take away, he, he had to drive to work because he could no longer work close to where he lived. And then they took away his driver's license because they can do that without court in Canada. And so then he couldn't drive. And then they took away his passport because they could do that too. And so in the meantime, to take him through court to siphon the last penny out of him and deny him access to his children. And I went out with him and his children several times. And they were all, let's see, two, three, and five, I think, three boys. We went out to this science museum, which is a challenging thing to do with three young kids. And he showed yeah. up on time on the van and he walked those kids through that science museum and they just had a wonderful time. And I watched him like a hawk and he was a really good father. And uh, she, pursuing him, her father mortgaged their house and she spent all their money, at which they deserved very nicely because they had raised her to be just exactly the way she was. And it was just a bloody disaster. disaster I worked with him right? for like three years trying to help him negotiate through this without dying, you know, yes, just because yes. he wanted his kids. And I pulled out every stop to strategize and we were careful and he did what we negotiated and and he was really dedicated to his kids, and he just got ground up, yes. man. And then and all this was, stuff blew up around me and around that, about that's, that time. That's, and that's I that story, what you him. talk about right there. I think I think you, I think I heard you mention that maybe a few years ago. That particular story, it may have been that one when you were when you were in practice. But um, that speaks to there is no escape. It's the zero sum game of of family law, and it is a game mm -hmm. to these attorneys. And it's not just no escape for me. Uh, as a respondent, it's no escape for the petitioner too, like with yeah, Johnny right. Depp and his situation, right? So, you know, the false allegation of domestic violence, it's, it's, we, we need to remind people Johnny Depp has not been found, not only not been found guilty of any crime, he's not been accused of any crime. Um, he's been tried and, and found guilty in the court of public opinion, guilty till proven more guilty. And I think it's that, it's those kinds of, um, you know, th that in inability to escape the divorce trap. There's no trap door. There's no way out for both parties. Um, and you know, my, my ex-wife spent 1.8, I, th I believe it's $1.8 million on an, on an attorney, her attorney, yep. Judy Bogan. Um, and then after four years, this attorney just filed to the court to be released from the case. And I believe is now suing my ex-wife for $450,000 on top of that. So the, the blatant plundering of an estate, um, and how someone you've, you've worked your whole life, you've, you've, you know, started from not a lot and you've, you've, you've plowed your field in your career. And the notion that just because you have a marriage contract, um, because, you know, I, I, I believe in monogamy. I believe in family. Obviously I made some missteps along the way. I mentioned those in the book. I was, you know, flawed. One thing I wasn't was a bad, I was a great dad. I will s s shout that to the rooftops. I was a brilliant father. My sons loved me and I loved them. So if it could happen to me, uh, and it can happen to Johnny Depp, Brad Pitt. It can happen. It's, it, it's, it's happening and it has happened for decades from my research to so many people. And there's a voiceless, um, growing group of people who've had enough. Well, the, the guys, the guys that it really happened to, you don't even hear from them. That's they're right. so done, man. Some of them are yes. just dead. Oh. And the ones that aren't dead, they're, they're done. They're exhausted. They're sure. friendless. They're, struggling Hopeless. away to yeah 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 i mean it's like yeah. you took i think i wrote about the the, the i've talked about the child support hustle you know skip child support go to jail lose job repeat you know poor to your point poor non-custodial parents 
many times forsaken fathers or, or the patriarch or the dad who lack the ability to pay child support end up in modern day debtors prisons, if you will. A person who fails to pay child support can have their driver's license, yeah, exactly. uh, professional license and passport revoked. Um, yeah, without any, without any, with, with, yeah, yeah. And that's just, that's just in the hands of the bureaucrats who all that's turned over to. None of that yeah. has to go through court. It's like you didn't pay. Okay. We'll start stripping you of that, which makes it possible to you to make a living. So that, that's yep. really going to be helpful. You're probably hiding money and then maybe you're working below your capacity just for revenge. And that's not acceptable either. It's like, yeah, that's, I mean, some people might be pushed to that extreme, you know, because they think, well, how do you be motivated when your money is being stolen out from underneath you, no matter what you do? It's kind of going to take away a certain amount of your drive to provide, let's say, especially if you don't have access to your kids anymore as well. It turns you yeah. into a kind of slave. It, 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 well, that's just it. It's, you know, and judges can, can set the payment on presumed income. Presumed um, income. Yeah, yeah. That's you know, a nice, not what that's the, a nice Not phrase. what the non-custodial parent is actually making, causing fathers to enter, and sometimes mothers, but mainly fathers, a crushing cycle of incarceration. I remember talking with one father who was in prison. He was in jail in New York, and there was a bail reform, and they let everyone out apart from the dads who owed child support. And of course, while they're inside, the interest is accruing. And if they manage to pay the debts, the fines and, and high interest rates charged, uh, they're, 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 that money doesn't go to the custodial parent. It's going to the state. So the state well, wants there's, its pound there's of flesh. Also the additional problem here is, you know, there's going to be young men listening to this and they're going to be thinking, oh, my God, I better never get married. And so this whole catastrophe is undermining the idea for young men that marriage is something that anybody sensible would ever enter into. But then that doesn't really help either, because if you live with someone for six months or a year, you're basically common law, at least at some <laughs> point along the way, and it doesn't matter anyways. You So what are you supposed to do? Just forego, you know, permanent relationships with women altogether? Because, well, that's hardly a solution. Although it's a solution that not so many, that, that a non-trivial minority of young men are seriously considering. And there are many reasons for that, but this is one of them. Yes, why would, why would you? I mean, I was talking with someone the other day through my charity about uh, an app they have called I Do. And it, it basically, it, it marries you and, and divorces you automatically. So <laughs> within a time frame that will save you from actually paying, you know, alimony and 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 uh and, it, and it's worked out by the state that you're in i mean the notion that that, that we have to contract marriage that's where, where i arrived i believe in marriage but the institution no the way it's set up it's just it's it's a fool's errand had i known now what i knew then why can't we get married in the eyes of god or the eyes of religion or the eyes is in, in a spiritual place of worship Whatever you, whatever the couple decides to, to, to enact that, that union ceremony, um, why does it have to be a contract with the state that the state can then come in and dis and negotiate without my say, without either say? Uh, they can not even only negotiate, they could just take away what they want, when they want. So it's, it's a real, it's a real challenge. Like, where's the, where's the, um, you know, the ideological line in terms of I believe in marriage, but I would caution, I would caution younger people. Well, about then the question then is, what exactly are you doing when you caution it? Because, hmm. you know, yes, but with caution, well, exactly what do you mean by that? And, and the answer to that is, well, it's by, it's by no means clear. I suppose the answer to that lack of clarity is something like, well, the laws need to be changed. They seriously need to be changed. And so, Presumption of innocence would be a nice start and default 50-50 custody. What about splitting of assets? Like, where do you stand on that? I mean, I can't help but think that it's absurd in some sense that Paul McCartney's ex-wife got half of his fortune. It's like, and perhaps that's not exactly true, but you know what I mean. And the we are talking about a default 50-50 child custody arrangement. Is the right arrangement in relationship to assets 50-50? Once the marriage takes place, and is that also true, and I'm out of my legal depth here, is that also true in the case of common law marriage, and should it be the case? Yeah, common law, I'm, I'm not too up to speed on that. Um, 
I would say, you know, again, it's, you know, I'm talking with another technology company about a software. They have what in divorce court, what's called a disamaster. So all of the financial numbers, the forensic account, accountancy, all of those numbers go into this machine and it spurts out what people have to pay, what people receive in terms of child support and alimony. And, uh, this app actually would, would take in that, that information before, during and after, if there is an after while people are married and if they decide to separate to actually calculate who brought what, how they brought it. But it's again, how do you determine that? Uh, because the value oh, of God. the value well, of a mother, that's, that's I mean, a, that's a quick route to divorce right there, man, trying to it? negotiate all that. <laughs> well, absolutely. Because you partly what you do in a marriage is you enter into it and you have to with trust. Because otherwise, how can you enter into it? And the trust has to be, I presume that you're going to do the right thing here. And you presume that for me, and we'll struggle forward trying to do that. And if we have to, ne if we have to negotiate the terms of our eventual disunion, well, it's like we're negotiating the disunion right now. And so yeah. I just can't yeah. see how that's going to work well. And so, look, what do you, if you look back, what do you, you must ask yourself this like a hundred times. What did you do wrong, do you think, that led to the dissolution of your marriage? Or is that an unreasonable question? What did you bring to the table that made things go sideways? You said you were a great father, and so yep. hooray for that. But your marriage went sideways, and, and why? Well, the part that I'm responsible for, I can talk to that. Uh, I wasn't monogamous. I wasn't faithful. Um, that was probably the biggest, she had found out after all this happened that that was the case. Um, so that would be, I would say the, the kind of biggest factor. Uh, Do you think that this marriage dissolution would have taken place if that had not been the case? I mean, cause I, I'm sorry to push you, but I'm going to, because this is so bloody important, you know, and yep. what happened to you is so terrible that every, and happens to many men and a not insignificant number of women. It's so terrible that it needs to be delved into deeply. And so you were looking for something outside the marriage, obviously, and perhaps that was because there was something that wasn't in the marriage or, or God only knows why. Um, and so, well, was, there wasn't emotional was intimacy. There was. You go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say there wasn't emotional intimacy. There wasn't physical intimacy. The sex had dried up uh, after after the you know first kid, and we I tried talking about it. You know, the male sex drive was there. It is there. Yeah. So and, let's um, have, okay. So let's go into that. That's a good one because that happens to lots of people in their marriage. You know, I mean, yeah, and and it happens as you get older, and it happens as you have kids because you know you have. 15 priorities but only 10 of them ever get implemented and maybe like number 14 is sex or something like that and so it goes away and it's really hard for people to negotiate and you said you you tried to talk about it i guess i would like to know how hard did you try and how many times and how insistently and why didn't it work i mean because uh. i have clients in this situation and i'm talking to both of them I wasn't a marital counselor, but sometimes I would talk to both. It's like, well, how often do you think you should have sex? Let, let's get a range here, okay? Zero times per year is too few. And like twice a day, that's too many. So now we got, we got the parameters defined here, right? So we're not going for zero. We're not going for you never get out of bed. We're going for something in between that. And so we might look at what's acceptable for the average couple and maybe that's something like twice a week or three times a week and that's a place to start and so because it's not optional this isn't optional exactly and you say well you're gonna you're gonna turn it into a routine you're gonna take all the spontaneity out of it it's like well how's that spontaneity going for you exactly it's like well we haven't had sex in six months so, so yeah, it's, it's really important and really great points. And I think as well, it's not just the sex. I mean, there is, yeah. you know, there is, there is emotional intimacy. There's affection. There is, um, you know, um, that, that, yeah, well, that, hopefully that, that's all part of the, that's all part of sex when it's really working properly. Like I well, had this one <laughs> client who was terrified of women to a degree you can't possibly imagine. And he was so terrified of women, he couldn't even get near one. And he was in his 40s. And he had his problems, believe me. And that was one of them. And his mother, who was about 80, was still taking care of him to some degree. And she needed to because he had a lot of impairments that were real and, and profound. 
And I suggested to her that I take him to a strip club because that was the only place I could think of to expose him to women in any possible sense. And she and was you? a very conservative person, this woman, but she agreed immediately. And so we went once a week for oh, quite a long time. And one of the things I really learned when I was there that a lot of the men that were there were there for emotional intimacy, for whatever they could get, for some touch, like you think it's pure sexual gratification, but, and of course the, that element is there, but most of these men were desperately alienated and lonesome and they were there at, and I'm not being naive about this, I've been in strip clubs, I know what they're like, but that the idea that what you're negotiating in relationship when you're negotiating sex is just the the climax, let's say, that's just wrong. You're negotiating physical intimacy and that's not optional you know like babies die without physical intimacy and yes. children don't grow up properly unless they're played with and touched and cuddled and even animals are like that and and so this negotiation is of crucial importance and so i'll go again you said that you you talked about it what happened when you talked about it it was shut down. I mean, how, how I was insistent at times. I was, uh, I would continue to revisit the subject. I would implore to go and speak with a professional, um, therapist. Right. Well, um, and there's so nothing we sexier than a man imploring. <laughs> well, sure. sex, you know. darling, yeah, let's go. I, yeah, <laughs> let's no, go. It's... No, but that was one of the tactics. I mean, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah, you yeah. know, the way you have to, you have to deploy multiple tactics. I tried courtship. I tried, you know, I was exasperated at times, you know, look, if, what do you, what do you think I, I what do you expect me to do? Go outside the marriage, you know? Yeah. Uh, I have to, there has to be some, you know, so as what patient was, what as what I do you, was. What do you think? What do you, th okay. So when I, was doing this professionally, we'd start with these, you know, framing frequencies, let's say. And then we would, and these were people who were entered into this in good faith. So they were trying both to move forward. And we'd say, well, you know, have a date this week. And what you do as a marital counselor or a sexual counselor in situations like that, when people haven't been intimate for a long time, you say, well, you're going to go, you're going to have two dates this week, or maybe one, and you're going to hate it because it's awkward. And you don't like each other and you're, you know, you're, you're separated from each other. But here's the first rule is no sex to consummation. Zero that you do not do that to begin with. And so you kind of have the person revert to the first stages of what would have been a protracted courtship, right? And yeah. you go out and you have dinner and then they come back the next week and they say, I say, how'd it go? And they say, it was awful. We just, all we did was fight. We're never doing that again. And the answer was, well, I see you're never doing that again, eh? It's like, that's your solution? No romance now for the rest of your life? You're just going to live and you're going to hate each other? That's your solution? How about you need to do this 20 times before you're not absolutely bloody awful at it? And so with, but it's very hard, you know, if you haven't been trained yeah. to think about such things like that, you don't know that you need to take 10 steps backwards. You don't know that you need to forbid full sexual contact for a while while you're kind of reintroducing it. And 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 this, of course, as I said, this was being negotiated between two people and me, let's say. They had already agreed that they were going to do what they could to fix this. So they were both kind of, even though they're resistant to it in their individual ways, they were both willing to experiment to find a solution. And I don't know what you do if you have a partner that just refuses point blank to go there. Well, I think you, you, you said it right. The willingness to experiment and, and, and have a little nuance and a little doubt to rekindle and revisit maybe why you came together to kind of that nostalgic savoring of the first meeting or the first few times and to, to yeah, maybe well, try that, something new. Yeah. Well, that one of the things I often did with people was ask them, okay, well, what attracted you to the other person to begin with? You know, and then. They'd usually get misty eyed, both of them, when they were talking about that, because they weren't that happy that their love had disappeared. So, okay, so then I'll ask you a, a deeper question than that. So why do you think your wife was unwilling to engage in those negotiations with you? I mean, it could be, we could say, well, lack of skill on your part in the negotiation, and that's who the hell knows how to negotiate such things. It's not easy. You know, and it's not like we have professional training in negotiation, even though we should, because people are so bad at it. It's just beyond belief. Yes. They have no yes. idea where to start. And so 
so why do you think you hit a brick wall? What did it st- did did you wait too long to start or I think I think I floundered because of much of what you talked about in terms of negotiation. You know, too many well, from what I know now um, I didn't know then in terms of the you statements rather than the I statements, leading with the I rather than the right, you, the nonviolent right, right. communication, the, 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 the way to, um, you know, the, the, the way to understand and collaborate through and negotiate through without it being serious to, to, to do it together. To not yeah, yeah, put demands yeah. or non-negotiables down. Not that I did. It was just yeah, an exasperation. Couple, yeah, yeah. Well, couples will come in. They'll say to one of them will say to the other, like, you never want to have sex with me. And it's been like that for two years. And I don't see that it's going to change in the future. It's like, well, the other person is set on their heels right away. Because you basically said, you've been bad for a long time. You're bad now. And I can't see how you're going to change. It's like, oh, my God. How are you going to start from that? And then maybe in a situation like that, you ask the person, well, if you could have the sex life you wanted, what would it look like? And you can ask each of them that. And then, well, then, you know, at least you got a mutual vision there. And they're, right. I would say men generally would like to have sex more frequently than women. I don't think... I'll probably get pilloried for that comment, but I don't think anybody reasonable would deny <laughs> well, I, it. I agree with you, and I'll get less pilloried, but probably be pilloried too. <laughs> yeah, well, it's generally the case, not always the case. But yep. you you can meet in the middle, that's for sure. Or no, that's, I shouldn't say that because that's not exactly right. What you want to do is you want to elaborate out a vision. Then you want your partner to elaborate out a vision. And then you want to create a joint vision that's better than both of those that's sustainable. And then it's yes. not compromise exactly but if you start with accusations which you're likely to do if you're frustrated and you have been for like three years and things are already sideways you're just not going to go anywhere and the other person will dig their heels in and and then they you know they hit you with counter accusations and uh, you know it's one of the things terrible failing of our education system is that yes the rudiments of negotiation aren't taught it's really I agree, not good. and particularly interpersonal relating. I mean, this is one thing we haven't, you know, the charity that I started, CPU Children and Parents United, we have three basic, you know, focuses in terms of what we are programs and what we want to do and what we are doing. Um, and the first one is communication. You know, we've been talking with Warren Farrell about bringing his couples communication in and uh, not just couples, but, you know, interpersonally relating throughout the generations and friends. And because to your point, when trust breaks down, whoo. How do you, how do you get that back? You know, we need to, the, the, Dr. John Gottman talks about, um, you know, one negative comment has way more power than 50 positive comments. So how do you undo that negative comment? Yeah, you can tell that if you go on Twitter and see how you respond emotionally. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, it's also true, easier true. to pick up on. So, you know, the other thing I used to talk about, one other thing I used to talk about with my clients was, well, here's a, here's a tactic. How about you watch your partner real carefully, and whenever they do something you'd like them to do more of, you tell them that you saw it and, and, you, and tell them that you're happy about it. That's really hard because generally we let normal go unnoticed, and we even let good go unrewarded. Or yes. you could really be foolish and punish someone when they do something good. Like maybe you're a bit jealous and your wife goes out of her way to make herself look attractive when you're going out for a date, which might be an indication that she has some sense that maybe at some point in the future she might sleep with you. But because you're jealous, you don't compliment her wardrobe or you say something snarky about it. And then it's like, do that three or four times and she'll never dress up for you again, ever. And then it's yeah. done, you know? And so... This idea of watching people and then seeing when they do something you'd like them to do more of and then telling them, that's really a powerful thing. I think that's a really powerful thing. And, you know, that's something that, um, to your point, can be – it's hard to take on new – New routines, new ways of being affe- of expressing affection. Uh, if you're not used to it, if you're hmm. more stoic, or if you're, but it, it it we have to. I think we have to give what we'd like to receive, and I think we all like to receive platitudes and uh, affirmations, and uh, you know, oh, that was lovely that you did that, sweetheart. Yeah, especially um, if it's I, specific. I, especially if it's specific. You know, you say, mm. "Hey, look, I just saw what you did." Here's what you did that was specific and like, yes, thank you. That's great. Yeah, That's yeah. That's great. 
You know, and it's funny too, because you do have to negotiate details. You know, it's, well, sure. think, well, how often do you want to be hugged? It's like, I don't want to talk about it. It's like, yeah, no kidding. You don't want to talk about it. But like, how about never? Okay, never seems a bit dismal. So, okay, let's see if we can do a little better than never. So maybe you have a couple in, and you're talking to them and you think, well, why don't you try once a day? Or do you want to just try once this week and come back and say how it went? And then you have to be patient with your partner because if you've been estranged from them physically and you're doing this hug because your idiot therapist told you it was a good idea, it's going to be perfunctory and, and a bit cynical, but it's a hell of a lot better than nothing. And so you come back and you're kind of irritated about it. You say, well, okay, you're practicing and you're not very good at it. It's, so it didn't go that well, but try it this week twice and see if you can just do it a little better. And that works, you know, but you got to be humble enough to know how stupid you are when you start. And it's, it's yeah. pretty pathetic how bad you are at <laughs> well, it. Well, you can also laugh. You can also find, find ways to laugh about it. I think, you yes. know, in, in the room, if you're with a third if that third is a therapist, you don't leave with the third, you know? So as much as a therapist can have ideas, it's, I think it does have to come down to the individuals who actually take that suggestion and really believe in it and want to actually move it forward in a positive way. Oh, yeah, and yeah. See yeah and it the potentially therapist, is therapist actually can't give advice. You know, you, you can only ask people. It's like, you can say, well, how often do you want to get hugged? They don't say never. It's like, okay, it isn't never, so... You know, is it once a week or something? But you have to ask. And if yes. you just tell, if you just ask, if you just tell people to do things, they just won't do them. They can't even tell themselves to do things and do them. It has to be negotiated. <laughs> you can't. You How try often? that. You tell yourself no, to I... do things. Christ, no, you won't listen. Well, the, <laughs> the conversation was, oh, I always say, you know, the two most important parts of the day, uh, waking up and, and going to bed and those mini rituals. And if you go to bed to sleep, then you're not going to fall asleep. You go to bed to rest. Sleep will handle itself. Right. Um, how many times, right, exactly. just curious, how many, how many times do you like to be hugged? Are you a hugger? Yes. I mean, definitely. you must have a lot yeah, of people like, who come up to you and want to hug. They do. That be, happens like, a lot. Tactile, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. It's fine, man. I don't mind that at all. I mean, when my, I'll give you an example of how this works. When my daughter, my daughter's a year and a half older than my son. And so kids that are spaced less than three years apart have a pretty high risk of fairly severe sibling rivalry. And that can get really out of hand. And it's partly because the older child is still pretty young to have an interloper in, you know, and as all also is called upon to be quite mature very rapidly, because when you have a one and a half year old, and no other children, you think that's a pretty young kid. But then when you have a newborn, you think, oh, no, that, that's an adult, man, it's just a short adult. <laughs> and so there's a big demand on the child to mature. And so then she, she or he can get jealous of the infant, and that can really wreak havoc. So we trained our daughter repeatedly to come and get a hug. And we practiced it. It was like, come and get a hug. And pr we practiced that till she got really good at it. And we said, whenever you're feeling upset, you just come over and get a hug and then you can have some attention. And so sometimes my wife and I would have a hug and we'd have the kid come in between us and then sh she could have a hug too. And so by the time this, our son was born, she was an expert at coming to get a hug. And so whenever she got upset, she could just come get a hug. And mm. But that took, like, you have to train someone to do that. Yes, and you think, well, yes. you don't have to train that. It's like, you would be surprised what you have to train and what you have to learn in practice. And, you know. When yeah, and also it reminds me, what it reminds me of, Jordan, is my youngest, my, my eldest boy, when he was born, he went to uh, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten. We would tell him, because we, as new parents, we were listening to the school and it was a very you know, Hollywood school. It was actually a Hollywood schoolhouse. It was all, use your words, use your words. So we drilled this into him, use your words, use your words. Then he, he went to kindergarten and he, you know, he got the crap kicked out of him every day. He was bullied mercilessly from kindergarten through first grade, no support from the school. And realizing that the, the tool of use your words doesn't make, it doesn't do any good when a big kid is coming up and punching in the face. So, you know, then my youngest son, um, it was slightly different and he's a little, and this may be a, you know, second sibling, uh, thing, uh, second born of his boys. I don't know, but that rite of passage of, you know, just being a little bit more rough and tumble and rough housing, the importance of that. 
um, you know, going back to the the issue of fathers yeah, well, being you got to use and, your words, man, but you got to have something to back them up with. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And kids are really good at sussing that out real quickly, especially the bully types. Like, they'll come along oh, yeah. and poke you. It's like, anything to you? No. Oh, well, then I can just pretty much steal everything you have, including your reputation and your happiness. And there isn't a damn thing you're going to be able to do about that. You think, well, mm. kids aren't like that. It's like, no, you're just naive and like heaven help your kids because being naive as a parent's not that helpful for your kids. And there's plenty of bullies on the playground and plenty in adulthood too. So aren't there? There are yeah, many. Yeah. <laughs> You've experienced quite a few. Um, but you you seem to be holding your own and you seem to be you seem to be back and um, you know, getting into a full schedule again. I see you going on tour. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank God for small mercies, you know, and for all the help I had too. So, but yeah. Hey, so tell me what happened with your kids. How old are they now, your boys? 17 and 15. My youngest turned 15 on November 22nd, the day before Thanksgiving. Um, they, they, I don't see them. I don't hear from them. Um, my, my arms are outstretched wide open for if and when, and maybe one day they will, they, there will be that reckoning, um, you know. So would, I, why I, do you think that, why, why is it that they're not seeing you? What, what happened as far as you can tell? Parental alienation. Uh, parental alienation is child abuse, plain and simple. It's brainwashing. And it's clear if you look at um, the history of our family and then for the 18 months the first 18 months that, that I was mired in court and had to have a visitation monitor that they, you know, I actually published this in my book at the end, the two uh, independent psychological evaluations that I was forced to partake in and pay for. I published those. One is 2015 and one is 2019 in December at the end. Neither judge looked at either of them or cared. But in the first one in 2015, December 2015, um, the psychologist, the psychiatrist included 70, I think it was 69 monitored visitation reports. And it's clear and unequivocal that my sons are suffering. They love me. They say in every report, I love you, dad. We love you, dad. I love you, dad. We want to live with you. And the system didn't care. Um, and so that, that spoke highly to me that the system needs reform. It needs improving on a personal basis. They now have this image of me having not been around that I'm someone to be a feared that I can't be trusted that I'm dangerous um and none of that is the case and none of that is true but um Jesus I their psychologies their their psyches have been so cemented uh at such a young age 10 and well, 8 well you you talked about grief too you know and the never ending consequence of of this grief that comes from separation without finality. It's like, they must've been experiencing that too. And yes. at some point, you know, the kid well, has we're also to... betraying the matriarch. If they, any time I remember yes, my, my youngest yeah. where it was a year in Jordan and, 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 Oh my God, we had a visit and he called me on the phone. I still kept the voicemail. It kept me going. It gave me, it was medicinal fuel for me to just hear his voice and know uh, what it sounded. I knew, always know what it sounded like, but he called me and he was like, dad, dad, dad. And then his older brother was like, get off the phone. Don't hang up the phone. We're going to be in huge trouble with mom. And he hung up the phone. And it's that right. fear, the irrational paranoid fear of, of me. Yeah. Well, at some point dad. it's got to be easier for them to let you go than to be torn apart on a day to day basis. You when know, I and, realized, yeah, when I realized that, that they were, after four years of monitored visitation, I finally got a, um, a visitation without a monitor, uh, watching my every move and writing it down. And then I realized that they were, they were both, and they weren't allowed to have their iPhones with them, their phones with them on visits. Mom wouldn't let them. But they both had their phones and they were sticking, they were videotaping. And then, and then I, I, it, it became clear to me through other channels that they may have been fitted, at least one of them, with um, body cameras. And when it got to that place, I, where my sons are being used as a tool against me to try and record incriminating evidence, that there has to be an end to that for them. So part of why I, I came to some kind of resolution and ending on it 
Um, and, I, and I gave up so much. I mean, she wouldn't even give me through the settlement agreement. She wouldn't give me the rights to know, to let me know if our, either of our sons were on life support and the button was going to, the switch was going to be, you know, permission was going to be given that they would die. She wouldn't, she wouldn't legally have to let me know. And, but I didn't even realize at the time that every, everything in our settlement agreement that, that I got, which was very little, she hasn't held to anyway. Because she knows that ultimately it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars to go back to court in the same system, zero sum, and so on yeah, so one forth. Of, so. One of the things I learned from being a clinician was that restraining orders only work on the people on whom restraining orders work, for example. <laughs> so I had some clients who had like six restraining orders on them. One of them, I remember, he was really paranoid. He was, he was hard to deal with. I got somewhere with him, but it's very hard to deal with a paranoid client. And he was clinically paranoid. And well, it's like NDAs, you know, non-disclosure agreements. The, you know, really yeah, they yeah. aren't worth the paper they're written on because people are just going to do what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So enforcing that's very difficult. He used to say to people if they annoyed him, <laughs> now and then he'd get tangled up with someone who was bureaucratic in their inclinations and he'd say, I'm going to be your worst nightmare. And, you know, sometimes <laughs> you might want to say that to someone, but you don't really mean it. He really meant it. Oh. Six restraining or oh yeah, you have no well, how idea. Do, how do you? How do you? I'm curious, okay, because this is the false allegations of, of DVs and TROs. I mean, you know, over seven. I think it's around over seventy percent. I'd have to check on the stat of domestic abuse allegations resulting in a TRO, a temporary TRO restraining order. T -TR, yes, temporary restraining, temporary restraining order or EPO, emergency protection order, are not sustained. Once the case moves to a permanency or uh, evidentiary hearing, this shows that the majority, perhaps the majority of domestic violence allegations are, are perhaps false or unprovable. Um, and I think yeah, well, this correlation the, the with what's going on the in rub, the rub there. Well, is I was going to say that I think the, the, go ahead. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the correlation with cancel culture and victimhood being the new social currency, um, this is an affront to the real victims of domestic violence. So how do you tackle uh, this, the, the false allegation, the perjurer, um, if the allegation works every time? If yeah, the well, silver that, bullet then gets the rewarded? The question is, absolutely. Well, then the question is, too, how do you stop people from using systems there that are there to protect the vulnerable from being used as weapons. You think, well, people wouldn't do that. It's like, yeah, yeah, you just wait till you tangle with someone who'll do that and you'll change your, yeah, who is right. I don't know why people always make that particular noise when they hear about such things, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, I've seen those systems, wep well, they've been weaponized against me continually, but I've seen people just brought to their, well, same, same place you were brought to. It's like, you yeah, just get no, tangled up with child protection services for a week and oh. see what your life is like. Well, an hour. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, yeah, false no allegations kidding. that these false allegations that are used in family law to thwart the non-resident parent and child relationship need to be dealt with in a way that protects the relationship that is under attack, and in a way to dissuade the making of these allegations or accusations going forward. And well, from one what of the I things we see, could, one of the things we could warn people about in this podcast is if you're thinking about making such allegations, don't be so sure that your own arm won't get tangled up in the machine. Mm. Cause it's, you think, you know, you're going to leverage this, this enterprise to punish your partner. And you're maybe you're willing to do that because you've been pushed to your limit in some sense, or maybe just cause you're feeling a bit malevolent. It's like you wear loose clothing close to that machinery and you're going to get pulled in and spit out. And so it won't just be you going down the negative pathway. And problem with that is, is that some people, they get so inclined to wreak havoc and to extract revenge that they're perfectly willing to hang themselves in the window to block out their neighbor's sunlight, let's say. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna go on a journey of revenge, dig two graves, you know. Yeah, that's uh, right. That's for sure. You know, and, and when I this is what I think about with you know the Pandora's box that she let that she, she let out. The only thing that was left was hope. Is is those who you know God will forgive our sins. Our nervous system won't. Um, and that, that yeah. I, this is this is that false allegation. You know that technique and tool being weaponized. For financial gain, I just wonder when this will reach a. Yeah, it's a we real have problem. a president in America. We have president who's a Catholic father and grandfather, 
And the Violence Against Women Act was his act in 1974. And that, that's a series of, it was a series of law enforcement grants that shifted the focus away from the problems of um, the relationship to a law enforcement approach to domestic violence, resulting in a shift from the prior discretionary approach to mandatory arrest or detainment policies. And, and I think that that's the kind of holding space, like purgatory, where, like in my case, Jordan, when the police came, they couldn't arrest me. I've never been arrested. They couldn't arrest me because I hadn't committed a crime, but they had to remove me because I was seen as a danger. Where do they take me? They can't put me in a prison cell for long because I, I would need my Miranda rights read to me. I'd need an attorney and access to one. You know where people like me end up? 5150 holds. You know those who need to be on 5150 holds where they end up because they were thrown out into the prisons? So, you know, those who are actually emotionally disturbed, who need help and need assistance, go to the worst place possible for them, jail. And prisons, our prison system. And those men and sometimes women like me who have a false allegation, false accusation made, there is no real place for the system to... So the police used to have discretion. And now all this money that President Biden created through pushing through his, his act, and by the way, VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, is being, you know, it's being looked at again. Uh, they called it stop grants. It was money for stop grants. So to qualify for these stop grants, law enforcement had to adopt these policies of mandatory arrests. So, you know, forcing law enforcement to prosecute or persecute every man who's accused of domestic violence to keep the coffers full. Like, this is the incentivized structure that we have. So how can we change that? But then, you know. Yeah, well, I guess we start to change it by having conversations like this, right? And trying to specify what the problem is, because it's really complicated what the problem is and then what the solution should be on a legal basis, what the solution should be ethically and on an individual basis. It's so... You know, a thousand conversations like this is a place to start. So I think so too, and I think I think more uh, proactive solutions. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do through through my new fledgling charity is to is to have um, you know the communication programs. And where can people find out about that? That's Children and Parents United. Where and yeah, that's right now. That lives in Sorry, go ahead with the charity. Yeah, right now, Children and Parents United, or CPU, is uh, our mission is to promote and improve child well-being uh, by providing information and resources to policymakers, um, the public, uh, practitioners, resulting in, in in reduced conflict and enhanced uh, relationships uh, for those children and parents negotiating our current family law systems. And we have three. The place to find that is therespondent.com. We will we'll be launching the, the, the website for the charity soon, but right now it lives at therespondent.com. But we have three cost-effective, practical, solution-based programs right now, communication workshops and programs that we're working out and developing that promote improved interpersonal relating. Um, mediation, uh, CPU mediation, which we call it, is to provide mediation services. I just actually, I mediated my first case. I wanted to do one myself just to see. Um, and I, it was a couple who'd been in family law for six years, spent nearly $2 million, no resolution. I was able to find resolution and settlement within six hours on a Saturday and three hours on a right, Sunday. Because that's a way different process than trying to get each person all they can grab from the spoils of the relationship. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's not, I was, I, I heard someone tell me once, it's not, you don't get what you deserved, it's what you can live with. Uh, because you're always going to walk away from mediation, you know, feeling somewhat aggrieved. Um, yeah, at it's least not you can walk process. away. Right. Uh, yeah, you have life. Um, and then the other is a public interest law firm uh, providing legal advice so that supports the mediation process, oversees the legal, legal procedures, uh, so that if people do want to get divorced, if they do want to separate long term, um, that, that there's the, the ability to actually draw up those legal agreements and, uh, 
and deliver them. But really, we just need to keep people out of court. I joke that we are the yeah. Red Cross of divorce. We're growing yeah. and building out, but we need resources and infrastructure, and we're hoping to get that. Um, because now, hopefully, this podcast will help. So that's Children and Parents United, and that's at it's at the res- what's the dot com address? The respondent dot com. And that's after your book, The Respondent, Exposing the Cartel of Family Law, which is a description of your journey through, well, let's call it first purgatory and then maybe hell. (laughs) I think you're probably right. And by the way, the audio book will be out soon. And I've just, uh, we've added, we've been adding sound effects and ambience and atmosphere to that to make it, to make it really feel Hmm. like that hellish Uh, journey, you know, so you're actually there and present uh, more so than just a regular, like me reading the audio book. And I've got a couple of great people who've, who've helped with that. Andrea Romano, who's won nine, nine, nine time Emmy award winner. Uh, she voice directed it and actually read as one of the psychologists at the end of the book. So um, hopefully, uh, hmm. hopefully That's we'll do some good. And you know, the, the emails that have been coming back from, you know, I was asked early on by, you know how it is, the, the Hollywood, you know, marketing and pl- publicity and the publishers, you know, who's your target demographic? I said, well, look, if, if, if we can get the suicide rates down, if, if, if my book can get to one person that and they can feel like they're not alone. Well, that's um, a big deal for people to know that they're not alone, you know, and they're, they're, not, they're not crazy. I had a, an Af- 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 I had a, 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 a military uh, father he lost his legs in Afghanistan. Two tours at tours of duty was served with false allegations of domestic violence papers. <sighs> he came home homeless, hasn't seen his kids, I think, for six years. Jesus and has been Christ. representing himself in family law. And I think about that, Jordan, and it just, it, it makes me weak. Talk about being that. punished for your virtues, man. Whoa. You said it. You said it. You know? Hmm. All right. Well, Mr. Ellis, looks good to see you on your feet and through with Mr. this Peterson, to some degree. You too. Thank you very yeah, much. Pleasure I talking really... with you, man. Yeah, you too, man. Really, keep up the astonishing work.